We want to think about some abnormal conditions affecting capillaries now. But just a quick resume of the normal physiology. Blood's coming in here, 35 millimetres of mercury hydrostatic pressure pushing out. By the time it gets to the venous end of the capillary, hydrostatic pressure's dropped to about 16 millimetres of mercury, still pushing out. The plasma proteins are generating this colloidal osmotic pressure, 26 millimetres of mercury, but that's sucking in. Now we can actually represent this graphically. So imagine we have a line along here. And that line is 26 millimetres of mercury, representing the colloidal osmotic pressure, or what we call the oncotic pressure, generated by the plasma proteins. So that is basically going to be the same all the way along the length of the capillary. So this 26 millimetres of mercury here is going to extend all the way along the capillary. It's not going to change significantly. But of course the hydrostatic pressure pushing out is going to change. represented by the red line. So that's going to go from 35 down to 16. So this is the hydrostatic pressure. Pushing out. Now what this means is we can represent diagrammatically what's going to happen. So here the hydrostatic pressure is a lot greater than the osmotic pressure, so we'll get a lot of movement of fluid out. Here the pressure is a little less, but the hydrostatic pressure is still greater than the oncotic pressure, so we'll still get some coming out. By the time we get into the middle of the capillary here, then the, the pressure difference is much less, so we'll only be getting small amounts of fluid filtered. So here, at the arterial end of the capillary, because the hydrostatic pressure exceeds the osmotic pressure or the oncotic pressure, more is coming out. But when we get to the second end of the capillary, towards the venous end of the capillary, when the pressure is lower, then here, the osmotic or oncotic pressure is greater, so we're gonna get a little bit going back in. Here, the pressure difference is going to be greater so we'll get more going back in. And here there's a much bigger pressure difference, so we'll get quite a lot more going back in here. So that's what's gonna happen in the normal situation. Now I want to tell you now about some abnormal situations. And um, I think the first one we'll look at, well, it's not really abnormal, but th this one's about sweating. So here we have someone who's been sweating now, if someone's been sweating a lot, the sweat is made from water, so they're going to have lost water from their circulatory system. If there's less water in the blood, can you see that means that the plasma proteins are going to be relatively more concentrated because there's now more plasma proteins not because there's more plasma proteins in total, but because there's less water to dissolve it in, so they'll be more concentrated. They'll be more concentrated. So what we notice here is that at the arterial end of the capillary, the hydrostatic pressure is still greater, so we're gonna get some filtration. But now we have a higher osmotic pressure. The hydrostatic pressures are still the same. The circulatory system is able to maintain blood pressure via compensatory mechanisms. Even in significant dehydration, you've got to be very, very dehydrated before you'll start becoming hypotensive. But what, what this means is that even as early as here in the capillary, the osmotic pressure is now 
because it's higher, is now greater than the hydrostatic pressure, that difference there. And then here, pressure's greater still, so we'll get more going back in. And then here, there's a bigger difference, so we'll get even more going back in. Because at any one time, you've got about three litres of blood in the, sorry, three litres of water in the blood, five litres of blood in total, approximately. Three litres of that is water. But in the tissue spaces, you've got 11, depends how big you are, 11, 12 litres of water. So we've got all this spare water. So what it means is after sweating, the increase in the osmotic pressure of the plasma will allow for restoration of blood volume, restoration of intravascular volume, because fluid is going to be reabsorbed at a greater rate from this spare fluid, is one way to look at it, this spare fluid in the interstitial spaces. Now, of course, it's better if you drink, because this is, this, eventually this is going to become depleted and you will become dehydrated. But this physiology explains nicely why intravascular volumes and therefore blood pressure can be maintained even in the presence of really quite significant dehydration. So that's a, that's a really useful mechanism. Now the next one I want to consider is after hemorrhage. After hemorrhage. Now I think just before I look at this one I might explain a bit of physiology before we come back to this. So normally what happens is the, um, if we think about the blood pressure in the arteries, the mean arterial blood pressure might be 100 in the bigger arteries. So these figures here are MABP, mean arterial blood pressure. And in the arteries, that can drop to about 90 as it goes through the, um, the arterial system. But then the pressure drop in the arterioles is significant, down to about 35 millimetres of mercury there. That's in the arterioles. So this is in the arteries, that's in the arterioles. And then when we get into the capillaries, there's going to be a further pressure drop, as we know, from about 35 down to about 16 millimetres of mercury. Going to be a pressure drop there, and then the pressure is going to be even lower in the veins. Now, if there's hemorrhage, there will be a profound vasoconstriction of the arterioles. So if that's a normal arteriole there, of that diameter, and we know they have smooth muscles in the wall of the arterioles, after hemorrhage, that's going to get smaller. Now that's good in a way because that's maintaining blood pressure, because blood pressure equals cardiac output multiplied by peripheral resistance, and vasoconstriction is going to increase the peripheral resistance. So it maintains blood pressure. But can you see that that means instead of having this much lumen for blood to go through in health, there's only that little bit of lumen there after a significant hemorrhage. So the arterioles will vasoconstrict. And can you see that means less blood is going to get through to the capillaries. So the capillaries will be relatively hypoperfused. So the pressure of the blood going into the capillaries is going to be less. So that now makes sense of hopefully this diagram here. So after hemorrhage, whole blood is going to be lost. Now, if you lose whole blood in hemorrhage, if you're losing whole blood, so whole blood is being lost. We're losing blood. Can you see that means you're losing that's what hemorrhage is. Hemorrhage is loss of blood from the intravascular compartment. Can you see that means if you're losing whole blood, you're losing the plasma, the proteins and the red cells. So that means initially after hemorrhage, initially after hemorrhage, because whole blood is left, is lost, it's whole blood that's left in the, in the blood, containing the same proportion of plasma proteins as before. So the Oncotic pressure is still going to be 25 millimetres of mercury. So after hemorrhage, the oncotic pressure is going to be 25 millimetres of mercury. Normal. 
But can you see the capillary pressure is way lower because there's much less blood gain to the capillaries as a result of the peripheral arterial vasoconstriction. So what this means is even at the arterial end of the capillary, there can be some reabsorption of fluid from the tissue spaces. And as you see, as we go along, that difference is going to get greater. And here it's greater still. So we get more reabsorption of fluid. So what this means is in the hour or two after hemorrhage, the osmotic pressure of the blood, because the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries is reduced, that means that tissue fluid can be reabsorbed at a greater rate from the interstitial compartment. And again, that's going to restore the volume of the blood. That means you can take effective action. You can fight, you can run from predators, even after injury. Now, if you have a drink to restore the fluid, that's even better. But even if you can't, you're still going to restore your intravascular volume. That means you can restore blood pressure. That means you can carry on taking effective action. Brilliant survival mechanism, but based on this very simple physiology. So I think we'll leave that clip there. And then uh, when we come back on the next clip, we'll do a couple more of uh, examples from pathophysiology. Thank you.